So this is the new John McGeeock biography by Rory Sullivan Burke. And he actually sent this to me last week, so thanks very much to him for that. And this is not an advert for this book. He didn't ask me to mention this book in one of my videos, but I'm going to mention it anyway because it's brilliant. I've been looking forward to reading this for quite some time and it's more than lived up to expectations. Now, as many of you will know, I am something of a John McGeeck obsessive and I've talked about him many times on this channel, looked at quite a few tracks that he's played on. But I still think it's true that outside of a small circle of McGeeck nerds, his name isn't as well known as it should be. So I hope with this book and with what seems to be a general resurgence of interest in him, then he's going to start getting the kind of recognition that he deserves. And I thought I'd use the publication of this book as a convenient excuse for me to look at some more McGeeck on this channel. And I was just thinking about which song I was going to talk about today. And I think I've already looked at most of the best known McGeeck tracks, the McGeeck bangers as it were, and I've done Shot by Both Sides and Spellbound and a number of other Susie and the Banshees tracks. And I'm actually in the process at the moment of putting together a post-punk course, and I'm going to be talking about a number of important post-punk guitar players. McGeeck is going to feature very heavily, and I'm going to be looking at a number of great magazine tracks that I've not already made videos about. So more news about that soon. But as far as today's video goes, I thought I'd go for something less well known and talk about the song Castles in Spain by The Armoury Show. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment, but let me begin by playing through a bit of the song for you, um, and then we'll discuss what's going on. <laughs> show with a band that John McGeeck joined right after Susie and the Banshees and he was actually fired from Susie and the Banshees but immediately went on to join the Armoury show and they were I suppose a kind of post-punk supergroup. You had McGeeck and John Doyle who was the magazine drummer and then you had a couple of people from the Skids so there was an enormous amount of talent in this band and they were poised for great things and they had a big record deal and high-powered management but for one reason or another, it never really took off. They put out one album and then McGee left the band quite soon after that. And this song, Castles in Spain, was a single in 1984. I think it was supposed to be their big breakthrough song. And it might have been a minor hit, but it certainly wasn't a huge hit for them, uh, which is a shame because I think the Armoury Show were an interesting band. And the album from which this song is taken, Waiting for the Flies, is a really interesting listen. And yes, it does sound very 80s and perhaps it hasn't aged quite as well as the magazine stuff or the Susie and the Banshee stuff, but it's still a worthwhile listen if you can find it because it's not, I don't think, on any of the streaming services. Anyway, let's see what's going on in this one guitar-wise. And it really is classic McGeeck. We've got some great riffs, some inventive and intelligent rhythm guitar parts and a lovely melodic guitar solo as well. Okay, let's start with the main riff. And we're in standard tuning, and the main riff is the one that goes like this. Uh, it's actually a really simple riff, and John McGeeck, obviously a hugely accomplished player, but he wasn't about showing off or doing fancy stuff, I and mean, he was certainly capable of doing 
quite technically demanding stuff but often he was more about just coming up with the right part for the song. In the case of this riff, it's nice and simple, all played on the low E string. So starting here at the 10th fret, we've got a D, C, B. Then we've got the low E string played twice, then a bend. So bending this F sharp note, second fret on the low E, just it up one fret and then back again so it's a semitone bend and then hitting the low E again so nice and simple to play then we've got a kind of answering phrase to the main riff that goes like this recording it sounds to me like these two parts are done on separate tracks with different guitar sounds and this answering phrase has got a much more processed kind of a sound but you can certainly play the two riffs uh, as one guitar part as um, John McGeek does when you see him play the song live so this answering part is played using six intervals of a sixth and I've got 11 on the G and 10 on the high E and then I'm going to 12 on the G and 12 on the high E. And the rhythm is... The only thing to watch out for really is that you're, you're skipping a string here with this sixth shape. So you've got to keep the second string under control and muted. So I'm just kind of nudging that with my second finger. I'm tending to play this with all downstrokes of the pick. You could possibly play it with a bit of hybrid picking, so pick and middle finger. So that's the main riff and this little answering phrase. And what I was doing at the start of this video when I just played through a bit of the track was I was playing the low E riff with just a straight kind of overdrive sound. Then I was stepping on the flanger for the answering phrase. So that sounds like this. So that's the main riff. It's also the riff that's played in the verse of the song. Then the next little riff you hear is this one. And it's quite an interesting arrangement, I think, in this song, how it gets to the chorus. The chorus doesn't quite come where you expect it to. There's this kind of bridge thing, and it goes back to the main riff, and then more of this kind of bridge idea, and then eventually it gets to the chorus. But what's going on here is we've got... Essentially it's, it's bar, fifth string root bar chord, so we've got an E minor and then going down to C major, D major and then E minor. But what I'm hearing in terms of the notes is this. So I'm not hearing the third string at all, so you don't necessarily need to fret that note as you would by playing a full bar chord. I'm really just playing the power chord and then a note on the B string. And then I'm picking strings five, four, and then two. So a cool sound that I think. It's... Play that through once. Then we've got low E string and we're playing the same sixth based riff as before. So. Then we're playing these chords one more time. And second time we're going to a D chord. It's a little bit hard to hear exactly what rhythm he's playing there, but you could just kind of go with the vocal line at that point, I think would sound good. Back to the main riff. Then we've got some more D stuff. I think you've got the option here. You can just go to a D chord or 
what I think I can detect on the recording is maybe some harmonics. So either of those options would work. I like the harmonics actually. We're playing harmonics at the seventh fret on the DGB strings. Um, and that's actually giving you the notes in a D triad. That the harmonics that we've got here are an A, a D, and an F sharp. So and then we're just playing that low riff one more time before we hit the chorus. So let's talk about the chorus. I think this is probably my favourite part of this song. It's a beautiful part, really melodic, uh, quite television-esque, I think. It actually says in the book that uh, McGeek was a television fan. I think one of the reasons he got hired for the magazine gig is that he could play all of the guitar parts from Marky Moon. And I'm definitely hearing a little bit of that in this part. And it's, it's the bit that goes like this. <laughs> And the underlying harmony that the lead guitar part is outlining are the chords G, D, B minor and C. So we've gone to the relative major for the chorus of the song. It's a kind of classic songwriting move. You have the verse in the minor key and then you switch to, to major for the chorus. And what McGeek is doing is this. We're starting off with this idea. So I'm holding down a G triad here at the... 12th fret, we've got D, G and B, and I'm playing this. I've got a G and a B, then a couple of pull-offs, so, so pulling off from C to B on the second string and then pulling off from A to G on the third string. And then we're going to, to the D chord again. I'm Placing this part off of the triad shape, so this time at the seventh fret, and we've got so again we've got a, a pull off there from uh, G to an F sharp. And then I've got an open B string, and this is clever, I think. We've got the open B string, which kind of fills in the gap. While McGeer comes higher up the fretboard to play this high kind of melodic part so so that B string rings out and then we're coming up to 14 and 15 on the high E and then coming down to 2 and 3 so it's an F sharp and a G and then playing the same two notes down an octave whilst having that B string droning away. Then it goes round again. And the second time we're ending with some harmonics. So and this is harmonics at the seventh fret on the D, G and B, which is you know, outlining that D chord sound. So if I put all of that together, I'm just going to turn on some effects as well. So maybe a bit of flanger and a bit of delay. And this is what it sounds like. So it just remains for us to look at the solo and it's a lovely solo, really melodic. And on the recording, it's very striking because it seems to have been played with some kind of harmonizer effect. And that's providing a note that's an octave below the note that McGeek is playing. And I'm assuming that was some kind of effect done in the studio. It's not an effect that you see him using live, but if you've got some kind of harmonizer or pitch shifting pedal, just set that for an octave below and you'll get uh, a sound which is close to what's going on on the record but I'm just going to show the notes to you from the solo first without the effect and then you can hear a bit more clearly what's going on and all of the notes are taken from the E minor scale, the E natural minor scale and we're starting off with a bend. Uh, it's quite interesting it's a one and a half fret bend so a tone and a half so bending a B up to a D 
and then releasing it. So a striking way to open the solo. <laughs> Then we're over onto the B string. Most of this solo is actually played along the B string, and that was something that McGeeck did quite a lot, just playing up and down the length of one string. We saw it in the main riff to this tune, and he often did that rather than playing positionally. So, so this is just frets five, seven, and eight on the B. The next phrase goes like this. done on the B string. The interesting thing here is the use of the open string in there. So we've got the open B there, again there, again there, and again at the end of the phrase. So. The next phrase goes like this. So starting off with the 12th fret on the B string and I think I'm hearing this D note in there as well so I'm playing that at the 12th fret on the D so and over to this high E on the top string another one of these low D's and then and coming down to this G so then the final phrase is this really nice way to end the solo and we're starting off on this F sharp note. Yeah, it's a kind of scale pattern really, a sequence idea. And then we're just climbing up and ending on this high E. What a great solo that is. I'm just going to put all of that together and I'm going to step on my octave pedal as well so you can hear what it sounds like with all of the effects in there. talk a little bit about the gear I'm using today and about the McGeeck sound. Uh, there's actually a surprisingly good amount of nerdy gear information in the book and you don't always get that from rock biographies but I suppose with a book like this quite a high proportion of the readership is probably going to be guitar players so it makes sense. And as far as the gear that McGeeck himself used he remained fairly consistent throughout his career and I think the main elements of his sound are of course the guitar which tended to be the Yamaha SG1000 and of course the MXR flanger pedal which was a massively important component of his sound particularly in the Susie and the Banshees days and as far as amps go he tended to use a Marshall or sometimes it was a Marshall in conjunction with another amp like a Roland JC120 so I think what he did was had the overdrive and the dirt coming from the Marshall and then retained a bit of clarity and jangle by running a cleaner amp alongside that and of course he will have used other guitars other effects from time to time in the studio but I think those are the key elements of his sound and I'm trying to get close to his sound today with the gear that I have at my disposal and I happen to have this guitar here which is an Eastwood McGeeck 1000 this was given to me by Eastwood a couple of years ago I haven't played it for a while but today seemed like a good occasion to get it out and it really plays nicely it's a great sounding guitar I'm not sure how it compares with the original Yamaha I've never played one of those I'm tempted to pick up a vintage Yamaha SG1000 at some point if I see the right one but um, this Eastwood version of that guitar is a nice guitar in its own right though and amp wise I am using my Marshall and this is a studio vintage Marshall which is kind of a scaled down version of a Marshall Plexi it's lower wattage it's designed to give you that Marshall sound at uh, maybe not quite bedroom volume but it's certainly nowhere near as loud as a full-on 100 watt Marshall Plexi and as far as effects go I have of course got the MXR flanger and I've also got a bit of delay coming from a Boss Digital Delay and for the octave effect in the solo I was using 
an electro harmonics pitchfork and I also had a rat pedal which I switched on during the solo but the rest of the time the natural overdrive was just coming from the amp. That's it for this video, I hope you've enjoyed it. As usual I'm going to be tabbing all of this stuff out, it's going to be up on my Patreon page and I feel like I'm doing a service to John McGeeck fans by sitting down and nerdily figuring all of this stuff out so I hope that's useful to some of you. And do check out my other McGeeck lessons if you've not already seen them. As I said, I've done uh, Shot by Both Sides, Spellbound and various others. I'll try and put together a little playlist or something and have that up on my YouTube channel. So thanks very much for watching. See you next time.